properties now of ionic substances and covalent substances uh, and kind of see how we can differentiate between those substances if, when we look at the world around us. You know, is this piece of plastic, uh, is this a ionically bonded or a covalently bonded substance? And how might I predict that? Uh, but before we do, I want to remind us uh, how ionic and covalent substances are formed. So ionic substances uh, are always formed between a metal something on this side of the periodic table. The line dividing those is right there. These are all the metals from the, uh, or sorry, with a nonmetal. So an ionic substance is going to be a very uh, greedy nonmetal. It's greedy for electrons. It's going to combine with a metal, which tends to give up its electrons more easily. Uh, hydrogen here, of course, is also a Kind of the one exception to the rule is also a non-metal, so we'll be lumped into this category here. Covalent substances, on the other hand, covalently bonded substances, uh, are efforts by these greedy, uh, greedy non-metals uh, to share electrons with each other, and they do so by uh, getting in close proximity, uh, sharing electrons, giving themselves a sense that uh, you know they uh, kind of have possession somewhat of full octet of electrons in their valence shell. <clears throat> so covalently bonded substances always are uh, nonmetals with other nonmetals. An example, of course, would be you know, uh, chlorine gas, where two chlorines get together uh, with each other, or water, H2O, where you have two hydrogens combining with uh, oxygen. So now let's look at some of the differences between uh, chem the chemical and physical properties of ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Um, so first of all, we know that ionic compounds form crystal lattices. And that looks something like this, where you have uh, these ions, a positive and negative ions. Uh, usually the, the negative ions have ripped away the electron from the positive ion and uh, are therefore more negatively charged, and they form these lattice structures because that's the most uh, likely way that positive and minus negative charges would get together. Uh, you know, this negative charge doesn't want to be close to other negative charges, so it's going to surround itself with positive charges uh, to be as far away as it can be from the other negative charges, which really aren't that far away, but um, this, is, this is the way these lattices form. <clears throat> Uh, these substances have high melting and boiling points. And the reason for that is because it's difficult to separate these positive and negative ions. So if you look down here again, um, they're close together. They like the, the way their electrostatic forces are, are uh, set. And so it's difficult to separate those crystal solids out and melt them into a liquid or else further uh, separate them into a gas. Uh, these uh, uh, these ionic compounds conduct electricity, uh, not in their solid state, and so I, I perhaps should have said uh, uh, stated that here, not as solids, but only as liquids, and then when dissolved into uh, water. So these uh, ionic compounds actually dissolve usually fairly easily into in water, because water is really good at slipping in uh, between kind of the cracks uh, in the positives and negatives and pulling away and isolating those ions and then uh, kind of holding them in solution. So they conduct, conduct electricity, but I should say not as solids. Uh, because to conduct electricity, you have to have, uh, uh, you have to have, the, the ions have to be able to move around easily. Uh, and that does not, have, or the electrons have to be able to move around easily as well. But in this, in, in the solid form, that just doesn't happen. Uh, and finally, ionic com compounds are usually soluble in water. So again, I just mentioned that because water is really good at slipping in the cracks in water. So now let's look at covalent compounds. Uh, we usually see those around us not just in crystal form uh, or solid form, but we see them uh, often as gases and sometimes as liquids and solids in the world around us. Uh, <clears throat> the reason why these are usually gases 
uh, is because the bonds in covalent compounds, as you can see here, are very strong uh, holding these molecules together. So for example, the hydrogen here or the covalent bonds in this methane uh, here holding these four hydrogens to this one carbon in the middle of this molecule, CH4. But there's really no reason why uh, neighboring methane atoms, for example here, uh, would stay in close contact with each other. So it doesn't take a lot of energy to pull, kind of pull those apart and provide enough you know, vibration motion of these methane molecules in, in the form of energy for them to turn into uh, a liquid or a gas, which is why they occur. This is natural gas that we burn. It's why they occur uh, in nature uh, as a gas. And that's the same with diatomic hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, all of these uh, covalently bonded molecules. Uh, and that's also going to then give them the, the low melting and boiling point I kind of just mentioned. It's going to be easy to separate these molecules from each other, even though the bonds between, in, in the case like of this hydrogen, the bonds between these two hydrogens are really strong and difficult. Uh, you know, it's going to be difficult to separate those. Um, but to separate the hydrogen molecules from each other is going to be relatively easy. Uh, they're going to be poor electrical conductors. Uh, there's not free ions or electrons uh, in these substances to allow electricity to pass through. Uh, and many of them are soluble in nonpolar liquids. Uh, so uh, polar liquids, uh, like tends to dissolve like. So polar liquids dissolve polar substances. Um, but these are nonpolar substances, so they tend to dissolve in nonpolar liquids. Now, an exception to that, actually, is water itself and even nitrogen dioxide to a degree. And you can see these, these two molecules are shaped a little bit funny. And that usually uh, gives molecules uh, a bit of a polar nature. So in the case of oxygen, uh, one side of the oxygen molecule is a bit more negative. And in this case, it's on the top because oxygen dominates the electrons. And the hydrogens uh, kind of don't dominate their electrons. So their, their protons in the hydrogen molecule sort of have more effect on the southern end. And that polar nature allows the, the water molecules to kind of hold together because uh, another wa water molecule could, could kind of you know, stack up right here next to this one. And the, the, the positive would be attracted to the negative on, uh, on each of these molecules. And so they tend to want to adhere together uh, a little bit better. So those are the differences between uh, ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Um, and ways that you can tell them apart, substances in nature. So when you see generally uh, solid substances like this plastic, um, it's going to be uh, likely that it's an ionically uh, bonded substance. Uh, now in the case of plastic, uh, the reason that it's solid is not because it's ionically bonded. There's actually covalent bonds in the plastic, but there's a somewhat polar nature uh, to plastic. Uh, uh, other examples of the air, air we're breathing, obviously, is all these gases, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. So they obviously have low melting and boiling points. Uh, it's quite easy to get them into the, uh, get them to boil into the, into the gas state. 